get connected with Take Two Radio on Facebook or Twitter at Take Two Radio. For email updates on future shows, follow at Blog Talk Radio. For previous episodes, upcoming guests, and more, visit Take2Radio.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Take Two Radio. I'm Pam, your host, and joining me today is Automated Man and my co-host, David. <laughs> oh, uh, hi, Pam. <laughs> I don't know if I could stop that one, but um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not that automated. Yeah. <laughs> it just cracks me up when I hear that. I mean, it's so new that something that I added, so I don't have to repeat and forget what you know that something to say. I have automated man that now says, you know, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and blah blah blah. And so it just cracks me up every time I hear them. So, anyways, <laughs> and bear with me, everyone, in case I get cut off. I'm having issues with my internet, and I'm not sure if it's due to the storm we had today. But in the meantime, David will be here with you, and of course, our guest. And today we welcome screenwriter, actor, director, and producer. Uh, David Hyder, I hope that's how I say his name, uh, he's holding right now, and I will pick up that line to find out if I mangled his name. <laughs> David, are you with me? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I am. I'm actually uh, changing it to Hyder so that this interview will be more more comfortable. Um, it used oh. to be pronounced uh, Hater. Hater, okay. I wasn't sure. You know, I try to get on with my guests right before the show to find out, but unfortunately we're just now connecting. So I apologize that I messed it up on you. <laughs> not not at all. You're you're far from the first or the last. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Now, to differentiate between you and my co host my co-host yes. is named David as well. So my co-host, I'm calling you Dave for the night, okay? That yes, way you'll I know who that. I'm talking to. <laughs> well, nice to meet you, Dave. Whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> well, well and David what, Hader, I'm calling, you, I'm, I'm calling you David. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And, and, and your name again is? Pam. Pam. Well, nice to meet yeah. you, and thank you for having me on Take Two Radio. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. We really appreciate you taking the time out. Uh, I guess we'll. Thank you. I guess we'll start out with a little bit about you personally. Like, when did you know you wanted to be an actor, and when did the interest in writing start? Uh, well, I started acting uh, when I was nine years old. I, I, I lived in. California, and uh, we moved around a lot as a, when I was a kid, and, and so my mother would do community theater to sort of get ingrained into um, the community, and uh, she saw an audition for a kid's version of Pinocchio in, in El Toro, uh, so I auditioned for that, and I, I got a little part, and then after our opening night, uh, this very beautiful uh, 10-year-old girl who was a year older than me asked for my autograph, and I said, I think this this could be a decent career, and uh, so I was hooked, hooked from then on. It, it's funny because it, interviewing different people, actors, directors, musicians, it all seems to come back down to that girl thing. <laughs> it keeps it going. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good. You know, I never really understood football like that. At, you know, Theater arts for just all girls jumping around and you know being uh, romantic and dramatic, and I thought this is this is uh, the milieu for me. Yeah, <laughs> and you haven't stopped since then. Nope, nope, never did. Well, uh, when did you start I... screenwriting? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, well, I moved out to California when I was 20, and uh, I started writing then mostly just as an actor to to understand the process i read the screenwriting books and i wrote wrote a feature and some short films but nothing that ever got made and then uh in 98 i i produced and starred in a little film that was executive produced by my friend brian singer who had just directed the film the usual suspects and um and then after that experience 
he hired me to answer the phones on the movie X-Men, and we started discussing the script, and through a very strange series of events, I ended up writing that script, uh, and uh, I ended up getting sole credit, which made me the most successful first-time screenwriter of all time, and uh, uh, the rest uh, was history. Wow, right place, right time, right people. Yeah, you know, it's, yes. especially with it being your uh, first time out. So that's wonderful. Yeah, my first, yeah, that was my first writing job. So, you know, they say uh, good luck is when opportunity meets preparation, and, and that was certainly the uh, the case there. It was like being hit Definitely. by lightning. Definitely. Definitely <laughs> better than being hit by lightning. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, in, on reflection, yeah, much better than being hit by lightning. Uh, so I don't know. That was a terrible, terrible uh, analogy on my part. Yeah. <laughs> but we all understand it's been used many times over. So what but, have you learned about writing that you didn't know when you were starting out? Oh, I've learned a million little things. I mean, I've learned about, you know, when we were doing X-Men, we were really driving towards clarity and sort of making sure that the audience understood who these people were, why they have their individual powers, how the world is set up. I mean, the first movie is really all set up. Uh, And I got to play with the story a little more in X-Men 2. But since then, you know, I've learned a lot more about ambiguity i've learned about sort of teasing out the questions in the movie and and letting people search a little harder for for what we're getting at and and um i've learned how important it is to really nail down the tone of your film um i'm i'm better at writing dialogue i mean you know that's the nice thing about writing is is you get better the more you do it Exactly, sort of yeah. An organic process like that. Did you ever end up taking any classes for it, or it's just you were kept learning as you went along? I didn't, no. Uh, I never took any classes. When I produced my first movie, uh, my little independent film, I listened to 16 cassette tapes by a guy named Dove Simons, who does the Hollywood Weekend Film School. and uh, uh, And he talks, to a certain extent about uh, about screenplays and, and how they should be structured. But for the most part, uh, it was about independent film production and, and how to get your movie made. The, the indispensable rule was if your coffee isn't made first thing in the morning, you're not getting your movie finished. Uh, so I always, I always kept that with mm. me. David, you had a question for, for – or I should say Dave, you had a question for David. <laughs> Yes, I did. Um, could you go in again? How um, how were you chosen for X Men? Was it just for you? I mean, did you go into it wanting to do it yourself, or who, like, um, more or less, no. like, who got you involved? Uh, the director, Brian, uh, Brian Singer. I had known. Uh, and like I say, we, we'd made this little movie beforehand, and I, I, I was there when they shot Usual Suspects and a Pupil, and, um, but I really just needed a job. I was a broke independent film producer, and he gave me a job. He very kindly gave me a job answering phones, uh, and he, but he was, you know, he was very worried about the script that they had, and he, and I just started talking about it, and I said, well, why don't you have a scene where this and this and this happens, and that'll set you up for what you want to do. And he said, yeah, good, go write that for me. And I figured he was kidding. It was an $80 million movie. And then he, he wasn't kidding. And he started having me write scenes for him. And then he would just take in all the notes from the studio and just have me write it. So it was about three months of me working on that film before the studio figured out that I was working on it. (laughs) And then they were sort of forced they were forced to make me a deal. Um, so they paid me $35,000, which is the, I think the lowest, uh, pay for any writer of an $80 million film in history. And, and, uh, uh, but we went from there. So it was really, it was all, it was all thanks to Brian. I mean, he, he made the decision to bring me in. That's awesome. I, I mean, you can imagine 
you know, how much longer it may have taken to be able to do something like that if it wasn't for him. So that's kudos well, to Brian. I, yeah, yeah, well, I wasn't even trying to do that, really. I mean, I was mostly just trying to be an actor and make my little movies, and to work on a film of that size, I, I had no... I had no... I, I didn't know how something like that could even be possible. So, uh, so yeah, no, it's entirely entirely due to my, my very good friend. Awesome. Now, do you find it easier to write a movie that's based on a book or from an idea? Well, it's always easier to adapt something. If the, I mean, you know, I've adapted movies from extremely well-written material like uh, like Watchmen, where, you know, I basically took everything that was in the book and translated it for film and I've written things where I've adapted from books that, that were not so great that I tried to make better. Um, but I, I think having source material always always makes it easier. You can sometimes get lost with an original idea and, and sort of wander around and, and lose your way. So, uh, um, but I, you know, I'm writing something from an original idea right now, and that's uh, it's got its own it's got its own charms. You know, you you can stretch out in ways that that Oh, you, you know, you're not constrained by source material. Yeah, I know. As a book reader myself, I've, I've read many books that I've actually seen made into a movie, and a lot of times the movie doesn't follow exactly as the book goes, you know, how that's written, and yeah. so many things are left out. But I think it's impossible to include everything that's in the book because you'd be watching, you know, a four-hour movie then. Yeah, plus they're very different mediums you know you in a book you can do four or five pages on what the character thinks about jazz music or his you know his 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 thoughts that that go to motivate his actions and in a movie you can't do that you everything right everything in the movie has to be something you can take a picture of uh, you know i don't think people i mean it seems obvious but i don't think people really think about it from that perspective and and so so it's a very different thing, and people say, "Oh, the book was so much better." Well, you know, yeah, you, but you were right in the head of the character, and that is—I don't know if that's easier to produce or easier to draw an audience in, but it's but it's a very different form of writing, you know, which which novelists find when they when they attempt to write screenplays and and vice versa. Exactly, and and the fans or the people that go to see the movie that have read the book first. I think eventually get used to the idea that it has to be written that way for the movie. And, you know, you just need to get over that part, <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and the I movies mean, usually yeah. they're good. It's just that it's different. That's all. Yeah. And, and all movies are essentially a short story. You know, if it takes you months and months mm -hmm. to read a book, you have to realize you're, you're digesting the same story in two hours. So, right. Uh, right. So, yeah, there's a certain amount of of um, putting yourself in the right headspace when you go from a uh, from reading a book to to watching a movie. They're very different things. Although, you know, my goal whenever I'm adapting a piece of material is to always retain the flavor and the tone and the the basic experience of the book. And I think if you do mm -hmm. that, you know, audiences audiences tend to appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Now, from what I've seen, you've written for mainly action, horror, thriller-type movies. Would you say that's your forte, and would you ever consider writing a comedy? Yeah, I, well, I I am intrinsically hilarious, and so I try uh, – uh, I, well, I, I mean, I try to put comedy into – if you look at the, the uh, like the first two X-Men movies, I try to put – at least a joke in per page, and and um, you know I love the genre films. I love I love doing sci-fi. Um, occasionally I'll do horror, or, you know, but there's always sort of some supernatural element to what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so I wouldn't I, I wouldn't necessarily I don't think I would really enjoy doing a straight up drama where people were just sort of complaining about their problems, um, though I enjoy those types of movies, but I would love to do a comedy. And, if, and I'm writing a, a sci-fi film right now that is 
that is pretty funny at its base. So, um, so yeah, I'm trying to uh, trying to stretch that that side of it a little more. Oh, good, good. I look forward to seeing that. Now, you wrote the screenplay for Devil's Mile and had a role as Toby in it. Would you tell our listeners a little bit about the movie, please, and your role? Yes. Yeah, well, I, uh, just to clarify, I did not write the screenplay. I, uh, it was written and directed by Joseph O'Brien, who uh, oh, is a Oh, I'm of mine, sorry. I misunderstood uh, that. Toronto. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's, uh, it's, uh, but but I don't want to undercut Joe because he did such a great job. Right, um, right. I mean, I I had some ideas in there, and we we discussed the screenplay as we went, but um, but it was really Joe's baby, and I uh, he just asked me we're, we're we we go back a, a few years, and he needed somebody to play a believable uh, psychopath, and and so naturally he thought of me, and I said <laughs> um, I said great, you know, he said he sent me the script, and I it was just super. I'd never played a um, you know, a bad guy before. I was I'm, I was usually a hero was when I was younger, but I guess when you get older, you get you turn nasty. And so, uh, so he, so I went up and I, I went up to Toronto, flew up there, and and we shot. My my part took about a week to shoot, and it was great fun. And and uh, Casey Hudecki, who, who's uh, the star of the film, uh, is also an old friend of mine. And and we got to do a, a fight scene that took about four hours to shoot. And Casey is a is a superb stunt woman and I've had some fight training and, and so we just got into it and it was, uh, it was, a, it was brutal, but it was, a, it was a blast to, to shoot and to get on film. Well, I'll tell you what, I watched the movie and, and Dave did too. And I tell you, I watched it at 3 a.m. by oh, no. myself. And <laughs> I had to watch quite a few episodes of George Lopez to be able to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Okay, good. Found it, found it scary. <laughs> it, was, it was great. I mean, I have no problem watching paranormal things, and it's just, I don't know, everything together and the, the blood scenes. I don't want to get too much into it because, of course, we want people to watch the movie, but... Right. Wow, I mean, you really are like kind of watching it through your fingers. Sometimes it's it's a good movie. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Yeah, the, it was really yeah. done with with love. I'm sorry, Dave. What were you going to say, David? Yes, it was. It was a great movie, and I just wanted to let you know I watched at 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> was that less scary? Uh, was it a lot scarier? No, I, ju- I just kept in mind, oh, it's only a job. He's doing a good job. He's doing a good job. <laughs> I talked <laughs> well, well, I, I I, myself I, out of it. Oh, good. Well, I, I appreciate you, you, your your thoughts on it. I, You know, this was done by, it, you know, the movie itself was put together by my friend Mark Opowski, who is the producer of the film, and he and I, we're best friends in high school. I've known him for decades, and 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 it was really a labor of love that he put together out of his respect for Joe and his desire to make a, a good movie. And and you know, it's such a it's such a, a micro budget film, but I think they really accomplished something pretty pretty unique and pretty pretty interesting. So thank you, you for saying. You know what, too? You have to really pay attention to the movie because it messes yes. with your mind a lot. It does. It does. it does. And yeah, and you have to watch out for Toby because he'll he'll uh, he'll kill you with a tire iron. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I, that was my <laughs> weapon of choice. He got that message. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's not. It's not subtle. It's not subtle. But, no. <laughs> uh, but it sure was fun. Well, I saw two different dates for the DVD release. I saw August and I saw September. Do you have an exact date for that? Well, I think the DVD's out. I, I, it was, I believe it was August. Um, okay. The reason I say that is because I went to Amazon and checked the date to make sure it was out before I did the show, and it says pre-order now for September 2nd release. Uh, oh, okay. Well, maybe. Okay, it may just be on VOD at the moment then, because I, I asked my, 
I asked my office to get me a copy, but it hasn't arrived yet. So you might be right. Uh, it, maybe maybe the DVD isn't quite out yet. But okay. um, okay. but you can get it like it's on it's on my Apple TV and and probably a, a, another few uh, digital outlets at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, that clears that up. So <laughs> at least okay. the listeners will know they'll be able to see it now or eventually through Amazon on September second. Now, I wanted to ask you, as an actor in this type of movie, you probably don't see it the way we do because you're in the movie itself doing your part. Yeah. But after it's over, do you watch the movie and see how we see it? Yeah. Well, it's a little different in that, in that you know, I see rough cuts. I see, you know, I see it as it's being built. So... You really, I mean, it, it loses a bit of its magic because you, you know, you were there on the day and you remember all those experiences, and then you see it without visual effects and and um, stuff like that. So it's a little different. But but we did, we had a premiere in Toronto where we shot the film, and you know, we packed a, a movie theater and saw it on the big screen with all of the effects and all the music and everything finished and everything sweetened and just looking beautiful and and so that's the first time we sort of experience it as uh, as an audience and while it's not new for me I can I can sort of feel what's happening with the audience if they're laughing in the right place if they're screaming in the right places you know if they're adequately horrified in the right areas then yeah. then you that <laughs> that's the first time you get a sense whether the movie is is having the impact you had hoped it would you know Right, right, exactly. If everybody's walking out with their eyes wide open, their mouth hanging open, you know you did a good job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and just them, and you know, and people would approach me very warily after the film, and, and yeah. they're like, uh, "Yeah, I really liked what you did," and I'm like, "Really?" Yeah. You know, and, uh, so, uh, uh, so you you start to feel like you had had a bit of an impact at that point. Right. <laughs> Now, is it easy for you to watch yourself in a movie after you've done it? No. I I, I like it because of my inherent uh, e- e- egotism. But, um, but at the same time, you know, there's takes. I wish they had used different takes. There, there, there are little things that, Hopefully, other people never notice that I that I see, and I'm like, ah, oh, I, I could have done that so much better. And there's a line I was going to just say off the cuff on set that day, and every time I watch the movie, I'm like, why didn't I say that line? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there are it's 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 a strange thing because I've been in a few movies, and and you never, I'm never entirely comfortable watching myself. I always see the mistakes and and the things that I wish I'd done better. But uh, but at the same time, it's it's fun. I mean, I like. I, I heard that Donald Sutherland never watches himself in movies, and I, I I don't understand that. I what's the point? You know, I love to see myself. In yeah, films. yeah. It's just, it's just complicated. Yeah, I mean, you learn from it too. You know, for your next project. Totally. So totally. I can I, understand I, that. Know, yeah, and I just screened the uh, the film I did with the little art house film I did with with Brian back in the day, Burn. Mm-hmm. And that's you know that's like a seventeen year old film, and I and I was surprised at how much I really liked my performance because you know back in the day I'd watch it and I'd just be like oh this is horrible and what am I doing with my life and so on and so forth and I went back and I'm like oh you know, that was pretty good uh, it's all subjective you know yeah. <laughs> Well, I do know I've I've spoken to quite a few actors that won't watch themselves as well and and I feel mm-hmm. as you do that maybe if they watched it they would know, you know, what they want to do differently or oh, I did a good job with that, you know, that I know I can use for the next time and and things like that. It's yeah. just, I guess it's almost like going to an acting class, you know, but learning from what you've already done. Yeah, and you want to know how the tilt of your head affects the shot and how you know how a glance can can change things or, and uh, i don't know I, I i think it's very useful to be able to watch yourself but some people it just freaks them out and, and some as a director mm-hmm. you know you're typically told don't let your actors watch 
themselves, like don't do a take with an actor and then let them watch it back on the monitor because it'll freak them out. And some, some of them it'll, it'll throw off their whole performance. They'll just start second guessing everything. And some actors doesn't affect them at all. Um, right. Or at least they can, they can take it in stride and sort of say, Oh, well I'll try this or I'll try that. But uh, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. You know, actors are, are a rare and rare and delicate breed. For real. Now, I wanted to mention, too, that you're well-known for your voiceover work and as the voice of Solid Snake in Konami's Metal Gear Solid games. Now, forgive me, I'm not a gamer, so I don't know a lot about games, but (laughs) you seem to have a great big following for that. Yeah, those games um, were very, very big, and, and we did, I did... Uh, I think nine of them over the course of 12 years. And they were just, yeah, I mean, people know me so much more for that, for really that role than for my writing or for anything else put together. And, and um, but that's, uh, but it's a pretty nice thing. I mean, they really, the people that love the role, love the, love the role. And they're, and they're so sweet to me and they're so supportive. And, you know, I've got, 72,000 Twitter followers and, and Mm -hmm. you you, you just get this outpouring of love from people. Um, And, you know, I think snake is very unique in that, you you know, these people have watched him kill so many people over the years that they're very, very respectful when they meet me. So um, I don't think it's, it's quite the same as, as other roles. So uh, it's really been a, a unique and wonderful experience. Did you ever go to any of those conventions that, you know, they have for these games? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hosted the Canadian Video Game Awards uh, a couple of years ago in Vancouver. Um, so I went to the Vancouver Comic-Con. Um, I, I've been to a few. Uh, I, I try not to do it too often because it's really overwhelming. Uh, but uh, I'm going to do... I'm going to go to the Alamo City Comic Con in San Antonio in uh, September, late September, and then for the movie that I directed, I'm going to be doing press for that at. We've talked about possibly New York Comic Con, uh, Dragon Con in Atlanta, and I and I think there's a Comic Con in, in Boston that I I might be doing. So uh, I don't really do it often, but this fall I, I will be doing it quite a bit. How do the fans react when they see you? I mean, are they pretty calm when they come up to you? <laughs> or are they uh, like, ah. You wouldn't believe. I mean, they they get so rattled. And, you know, uh, grown men have, have burst into tears. Um, oh, my gosh. I've, I like, I, I, I met somebody. I was doing, there's a job I was doing. <laughs> I was doing an interview for for the DVD release of, of another movie that I had done, an animated movie long ago. And the producer met me and we didn't say anything about snake, but he could barely talk. And, you know, he just couldn't pull his thoughts together. And I knew that he was a, a snake fan. Oh my so, gosh. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. And, it's bizarre. That's nice. That's really nice. It is nice. It's, it's very nice. And, and, you know, it tends to, tends to happen a lot with uh, airport, security people so like because they look at my passport and they see my name and then i see them sort of do a double take and i know that it's coming and and these guys with you know they've got guns and they're just hanging out and, and they just fall apart <laughs> they're holding up the line <laughs> trying to talk about metal gear and i'm like okay well let's move along here you know yeah. keep order <laughs> But, but yeah, well, really, the thing it, is, you know, you'd think that that would get you through the airport faster, whereas it doesn't <laughs> because they want to talk no. to you about it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it gets everybody through the airport slower, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the reaction can be can be extreme. It's, it's very funny. Uh, it's still got to be fun, though. Oh, it's great fun! It's great, it's great fun. I have, I have, I you know, I tell my wife I have the ideal level of fame you know i i don't get hassled in restaurants i'm not you know constantly being hounded but every now and again somebody will recognize me or if i go to a comic-con you know people will freak out and and then 
you know, when somebody asked me at Vancouver, I was just swamped with people, and they said, how do you deal with all this fame and attention? And I said, well, you see the door over there? When I walk out that door, it's over. <laughs> so it's pretty easy to handle. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, I can understand that. We've had James C. Burns on our our show three times, and of course, he's so well known as Sergeant Frank Woods on the the Black Ops games, and and he kind of goes through the same thing that you do. So, (laughs) yeah, it's interesting. It's it's really nice because I wouldn't. When I was a kid, I wanted to be like Tom Cruise or something, and now I can't even I can't even fathom that level of attention. I just think it would be uh, so intrusive and awful. Uh, so I, I, I'm very happy with the way things worked out. I get, I get all of the benefits and the lifestyle with very few of the hassles. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. You couldn't ask for much more. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Now, how did you end up getting into voiceover? How did I end up getting into voiceover? I, you know, I'd always done voices and, and, accents and things since I was a little kid. My my parents used to do it, and I picked it up from them. And I, when I lived, I lived in Japan, went to high school in Japan, and I got asked to do English language tapes and a few video games there because they needed English speakers. And then um, basically what happened was I, I moved to Hollywood, and I guest, I did a guest star on an episode of Major Dad where I played Yakov Smirnov's Russian son. We, he was a major from Russia, and we came over, and I ended up making up out with Major Dad's major daughter. And um, uh, and I had this this heavy Russian accent where I took like this and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and there was a man in the audience named Gordon Hunt. Uh, he's Helen Hunt's, Helen and Bonnie Hunt's father, and he is a big animation director. And so he saw me do this part and then hired me to play a Russian on Captain Planet. And um, that was my first American animation job. And it just went from there. I started meeting people in the community and putting tapes together. And then I was Captain America in, in the mid-'90s Spider-Man series. And right. um, and I did a lot of anime movies. I, did, I starred in Hayao Miyazaki's the English version of Hayao Miyazaki's first film, and uh, it's been pretty pretty fun. Well, with with being in Japan and, of course, growing up here, uh, what difference do you see in movies versus each other? Well, the Japanese have a very different sense of storytelling. Um, I find it to be a lot more non-linear, a lot more experiential, you know, to them, I think, and uh, uh, this is only my interpretation, I could be way off, but it feels like movies there are more like a dream, a a series of emotional interactions and events, um, rather than the standard sort of three-act, story, plot-driven film that Hollywood tends to make. Uh, Of course, there's now, there's a lot of crossover in the in the two worlds, um, so, right. so it's hard to hard to make that generalization. But um, but I did I did develop an understanding and an appreciation for Japanese style storytelling, um, and and you know and I try to bring that to to what I do now as a as a writer and director. Well, it's the, our shows, our movies, and that are very um, popular in Japan across the seas too. So we must be doing something right for them to still be attracted, even though they do things oh, differently. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, definitely. When I was when I was there back in the day, I mean, the big movies that came out were Cronenberg's uh, The Fly and Top Gun. I must have seen Top Gun seven times in the theater with with various uh, girls and. Um, you know, Doug Simons, who did the Hollywood Weekend Film Course, he said, look, people people say that, oh, American movies are crap and European movies are so much better or whatever, you know, foreign movies are so much better. And he said, but you have to remember, we only see the very best of the foreign movies, uh, you know, the ones that are able to make it stateside, and the rest right. are, they're, 
and, and he said the rest, their crap is worse than our crap. So, <laughs> so it's uh, you know while while Americans make a lot of crappy movies, we also make movies at a at a, at a higher level of sophistication than almost anybody else in the world uh, on average. So, um, so yeah, I, you know nobody has an infrastructure like Hollywood, um, right. and. And, you know, say what you will about the deleterious effects of studio development, there are also a lot of very smart people who, who put a lot into these into these films. So when you get something like, say, Frozen, which is so beautifully executed, uh, it's it's done at a level that other countries can't really compete with yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Now, have you ever seen any of your movies with the – people talking in a different language i always think that's so funny that cracks me up i i know i i i have not uh, uh but i just i i just found or somebody well, one of my fans found a i i did a video game a live action opening to a, a digital video game where i played a space marine probably 15 maybe 20 years ago and uh oh. And it's all dubbed in Japanese. So my, you know, whoever did my voice is doing this, you know, <laughs> that, sort of, that sort of thing. And, and um, it's very, very funny to, to watch because I can see all my facial expressions and all the things I'm trying to get across, but it's this Japanese guy doing my voice. So it's all strange. Yeah. The mouth never really syncs up with the with the words most of the time, but you know we watch them anyhow because they're fun to watch. And and I'll yeah. watch movies with subtitles, you know, because it'll be something a friend will recommend, and it it'll actually turn out to be a great movie. It's just you have to learn how to adjust your eyes to the subtitles to know what's going on at the same time as watching the movie. Yeah, it's a bit of a, it's yeah. a bit of a skill, but but there's so many great films out there. Tough to it, it, it'd be a shame to not watch good movies with subtitles, I think. Yeah, yeah, totally. David, do you want to ask another question before we let him go? Or um, Dave? I'm sorry, I'm so used to calling you David. <laughs> it's all right. Um, um, David, what are the three main forces that keep you grounded as a performer? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, one, I don't take the world terribly seriously. I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that the rest of you actually exist. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> it may just it may just be a hologram put together for my benefit. So that helps me keep things in perspective. Um, I think uh, my friend Jennifer Hale, who is one of the great voice actresses of her generation, she she told me once. You know, she was already a top voice actress, and she said, "You know, I'm going to go back to a place of being a beginner. You know, but, you know, not not thinking that I know everything, but but wanting to learn more and more and more. And so, I think there's something very wise in that, in that you don't, mm-hmm. you never say, "Oh, now I'm a master. Now I can never screw up. You know, it's it's you can always screw up, and you can oh, and you should be willing." To, to, to screw up now and again to find more and more interesting things. So, so that helps. And then, uh, and then three, probably the desire to continue to work <laughs> keeps me, keeps me, uh, <laughs> keeps, keeps me humble and keeps me, you know, I, I never want to go into any situation, any artistic job without a hundred percent dedication and fire and determination to, to m- make it work or make it interesting. Uh, you know, when you start to coast, that's when you fail. So, um, so those are that's those are the things I try to keep in mind. Yeah, that's good because you don't want your head in the clouds and think you're too good, and then people start noticing that, and then they'll say, "Well, I don't know, he might be difficult to work with." So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you see an actor, and they start to get cocky, or they start to get lazy, and 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 it reads in their performance, and so. Um, so, you know, I think you have to try to avoid that, or at least I, I, I'd like to avoid that. Most definitely, David. Yeah, so, 
um, uh, which challenges you more, acting or writing, and is it harder to write for yourself? Hmm. These are all good questions. Uh, I Well, I love acting. It's my favorite of all my jobs. Um, I think writing is more challenging uh but I, I you know i love that as well it's a different it's a different part of your brain um and as far as writing for myself i don't i don't know that i ever have really written for myself i mean i've done some rewrites here and there and when i'm acting i'll come up with ad lib lines so no i i mean i yeah i don't think i would find it any any more difficult writing for myself than for anybody else. I mean, people ask me if I write with specific actors in mind. Uh, you know, some writers will, will will say, oh, this is for Leo DiCaprio or something, so they'll try to write with him in mind. I mm-hmm. never do that. I, I really, I guess because I'm an actor and so, you know, come from such an egocentric place in the business, I always write all the characters for myself and then... And then different actors come in and give those characters different life, you know, different realities, different different um, effects that they that they bring to it. So, um, uh, so no, I don't think writing for myself would would prove any more difficult than than usual. That's great. Well, last question is: Who would yeah. you like to work with, either writing, producing, directing, or acting that you haven't yet? Oh, I would love to work with Michael Fassbender because I think he's just such a a stunningly phenomenal star and such a great actor. Um, I would have liked to have worked with Stanley Kubrick, but I think that's going to be difficult. If that's a little hard. <laughs> um, I, I was lucky enough to meet Steven Spielberg, and to work for him would be would be pretty incredible. I mean, you know, I have so many people that I just love and admire in this business. I I, I got to meet with uh, Will Smith a, a few times to discuss movies, and I just love him to death. And so I, I was actually just saying to my managers the other day, I'd love to talk to Will again and see if we could put something together because, you know, he's such he, – I mean, he's such a star, and he's a great actor, but he's also just the nicest, sharpest guy so, um, so there's many, 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 many people. Too many to list, really. Well, what you'll have to do then is send the podcast from this interview to all of those people you want to work with. That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do that immediately. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm you... assuming they're listening. I just want to give a yeah. shout out to, to Will and Stanley and Stephen. Uh, if you're listening, let's 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 do lunch. Not not you. Sorry. Right? <laughs> yeah. Pam will go. <laughs> and David's buying. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that? And, I said, and David, you're going to buy. You'll buy the lunch. So. Oh yeah, well, I, yeah, it's on me. No problem. My pleasure. Well, for our listeners, they can find you on Twitter at David B Hater. Do you have a Facebook or a website or anywhere else they can find you? No, I'm not on Facebook, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I uh, I have a website, which is, I think it's david-hater.com, but it's really just sort of pictures from from various sets and things like that. I, I should be better about that. But Twitter, Twitter I'm pretty active on, and, and if people want to find me, that's probably the best place to do it. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We had a lot of fun speaking with you. We look forward to everything that you have coming up. And please keep in touch with us. You're welcome back anytime. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. It was was great fun. And, you know, I'd I'd be happy to come back anytime. Be well. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you very much. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. 
And for our listeners, be sure to check out Devil's Mile. I'm telling you, if you're into paranormal action thriller type movies, you have to go see that. Um, you know, get it on VOD or get it on DVD. Uh, as I said, it's on Amazon September 2nd. It's available if you want to, you know, pre-order that. But um, if you're a fan of David Hayter, you'll, you're going to love it even more. So, and I'm sure anybody that's listening to the show is a fan of David's. Right, Dave? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's so and funny all. calling you Dave. <laughs> I know. Why haven't you before? I <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, it's like, you know, I'm not sure if the listeners have heard this, but I'm sure some of them have. My husband's name is Dave, and, and my son's name is Dave, and my uh, father-in-law's name is Dave. So, when my husband and I got together and were dating, I called him David. But after we got married and had my son, I thought, well, gosh, I'm going to be yelling in the house, David, get over here. And both of them are going to come running because they're not going to know <laughs> who I'm talking about. So <laughs> they would I might come over trouble. there then. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to figure out a way to do that. So I started calling my husband Dave and my son David, and that's the way it's been since then. I have a lot of Davids in my life, let me tell you. You do? Many, many of them. Even my husband's best friend's name is David, so. <laughs> oh, my God, you're you're being flooded. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a pleasure. Is there a, a scary movie out with there? David that theme. <laughs> you what? I'm sorry? I said, is there a scary movie out there with that kind of theme? Oh, I know, right? Would everybody mean David? <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that George Foreman thing. He's got how many kids, and they're all named George. So, <laughs> oh. <You know? laughs> I think there's eight of them or something like that. My God, George the first, George the second. Yes, yes. Oh my! Exactly. I always exactly. thought that was a joke. I thought that was only for. In- TV purposes, but that's for real? It's for real. Oh, Lord. It's for real. Oh. I can only assume he yells out George, you know, the second or George the third, or maybe he calls them by their middle names. I don't know, you know, if they have different middle names or not, because that would be really hard with that many kids. Although you'd mm-hmm. get everybody's attention all at one time, so, you know, <laughs> it could Unless be a goes, good hey, thing, too. One, two, three. <laughs> Yeah, that too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, also, we wanted to mention um, any of the listeners out there that are fans of soaps, and especially those of uh, General Hospital, there's an upcoming event. It's called the Men of General Hospital, and that is going to be with Rick Herbst, um, Jason Thompson, and Tyler Christopher, and it's going to be on, oh, my gosh, why am I drawing a blank? What's the date? September 6th. September September 6th. 6th. Yeah, September 6th. Thank you for that. There's so many things going on all the time. There's a lot yes. of events, and sometimes I, you know, can't keep them straight in my head. And thank God for uh, Word Docs because I just copy everything on mm-hmm. there and then <laughs> tweet it out that way. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to go ahead and tell them more about where it's at and who to contact and all that good stuff? I I can do that, yes. Rush me to General Hospital, an afternoon with the men of GH is being sponsored by events by Wendy and Coastal Entertainment. They are They will be at the Palace Theater on 2384 James Street in Syracuse, New York. And did I mention, did I say noon to 3? No. Already? No. From noon to 3. (laughs) Thank you. And tickets are $100 if you go to Wendy directly. Um, If you go through Eventbrite, then you're charged the taxes. Um, you're charged like um, $6 more. And that's because Wendy's covers everything. 
when you go through her. So you, you're saving a little money if you go through Wendy herself. And you can reach Wendy, shown at 315-256-6519. Yes, and, and the ticket uh, information as well as everything we just spoke about, who's going to be there, the date, and how to contact Wendy is also on Take2Radio.com. If you go under the More tab, you'll see Events by Wendy. She has her own page there. and and you can contact her that way, or you can click the orange button there that says, click here to purchase your tickets now. Yes. And please do purchase them now, um, because time is running short, and we want you to be there. Yeah, today's I'm... already August 19th. The summer has flown by, and before you know it, September 6th will be here. Do you know if by chance they'll be selling tickets at the door? Well, who knows? I don't know I that offhand. About that. Yeah. Well, I'll have to ask Wendy, and maybe we can tweet it out if they're available at the door. You know, some yeah. people last minute, you know, they may not know if they can make it or not, and they don't want to purchase a ticket ahead of time. And, right. uh, you know, we'll go to an event and just purchase the ticket at that time, so we'll have to find out about that. But everybody right. go, yeah. go, I'm, everybody and I'll envy go. you. And, and, and if you do go, be sure to send pictures uh, to take to radio at gmail.com along with a little blog, and we'll put it on our fan page that we have on the website. David does that all the time. Sometimes he's lucky enough to get interviews with who's ever there, and um, we put that video up on that fan page too. Yes, we will. We do that. And let me tell you, if you are coming from far away, and it's good, you call Wendy, you make your reservations, she will put you up at the hotel, and I believe it is the Stay Bridge Suites in Liverpool, and you get a special discount rate. She's for all guests who go there, I mean, the suites are, you are in a suite, let me tell you. And they are like $300 if you're not any part of that. You really, she really has a nice deal with them. Um, I did the last time, that's where I stayed, for the Ryan Pavey event. And it's very nice. Um, guests staying there will get transported to and from the event. Yeah, that's awesome. And I believe the $70, I mean, you can't get that anywhere for a suite. So yep, was seven it, it's very worth it. I'm still fine. I haven't heard uh, any more. I, she didn't tell me if she heard from them yet. I think it varies depending on how many people uh, uh, will be there. It depends how many people there, and you know. And I think it's divided. How I mean, last time it was just the two of us. There was only two people at Liverpool at the suites, and it was seventy dollars. Who knows what it could be this time? Maybe the more well, that go, the less it will be. You know. That's possible. If you have any questions, just call Wendy again at 315-256-6519, and she'll answer any questions you may have. And we're running out of time here, so I do want to mention that our next guest coming up will be on August 26th, which is a Tuesday, and it's with actress Tracy Birdsall. And joining me as co-host for that day will be my other co-host, Sabina, who hasn't been on, I think, since what, last year, right? <laughs> it seems like it. <laughs> uh, I think. Well, when was it? April? No, April I, April 23rd. It was my birthday. April. Was the last oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, she's uh, Tracy has won awards for different things, for uh, leading actress in TikTok, for Award of Merit, uh, Action on Film Award, for Best Cinematography, 
and also Action on Film Award second place for Best Actress. And all of these things are in TikTok, uh, the short film. She's also made an appearance on The Young and the Restless as well as um, Loving. And I'm trying to think of that, uh, oh, Lordy B, the Family Ties. Family Ties, that's what it is. But she has a couple of movies coming up, and we'll be talking to her about that as well as different things that she has going on. And that will be at, uh, let me just double check, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on August 26th. So I hope you'll join us for that show as well. And with that, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us today, and thank you, David, for co-hosting with me. And um, With you. Have a great vacation. David's leaving us and going on vacation. He's going to uh, on a cruise to Alaska, so have fun with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Everybody take care. Have a good night, and we'll see you again on August 26th. Good night, everybody. Be well, everybody. Good night. Get connected with Take Two Radio on Facebook or Twitter at Take Two Radio. For email updates on future shows, follow at Blog Talk Radio. For previous episodes, upcoming guests, and more, visit Take2Radio.com.